And again, I'd just like to, to say in opening that uh, it is really a great pleasure to work with such an uh, outstanding team of uh, uh, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, uh, nurses, technologists, and support staff in the congenital heart disease program here at RSNA. Uh, it's a wonderful world-class group, and it's an honor to uh, have a chance to work with you all. Okay, I've sort of condensed uh, the title that Jamil gave me into uh, what we might call evolving techniques for cardiac MRI and congenital heart disease. <clears throat> Here are my disclosures. And uh, cardiac MRI techniques, we don't have time really to go into many of them and probably into none of them in any rate detail today, but we'll list some of the ones that are most commonly used and some of the ones that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, you've already heard from Pierangelo about CINE imaging for uh, MRI. That's the most common sort of workhorse technique that we use. There are also a whole family of techniques for looking at uh, myocardial motion and strain in a bit more detail. These are uh, generically known as myocardial tagging techniques. Late gadolinium enhancement imaging of myocardial scar and infiltration has become one of the huge uh, clinical applications for cardiac MRI over the past 10, 15 years. <clears throat> That's very, very uh, widely used now. Less commonly used in congenital heart disease, but I think increasingly topical. <clears throat> You've already uh, seen something about what happens when we give a bolus of contrast uh, and image the first pass. Pierangelo has shown uh, some of those. And we apply similar principles to do myocardial perfusion imaging uh, as well. Dynamic MR angiography, uh, you've seen some examples of. Velocity sensitive flow imaging, again, Pierangelo has mentioned. <clears throat> uh, and with MRI, we can do this pretty much independently of the orientation or axis of the blood vessel. And unlike uh, duplex ultrasound, the orientation of the vessel isn't really a big deal for us. We can orientate the uh, image slice in any plane. And then there's increasing uh, interest recently in the measurement of MRI relaxation times for the estimation of compartment volumes. That's all a mouthful, and we won't go into that in any detail. Suffice it to say, it's a way to kind of quantify regional, local, extracellular volume fraction uh, in the myocardium. And lots of others uh, in progress and coming, which we won't even touch on. Okay, cine imaging, here's an example. <clears throat> uh, this patient presented acutely with a deteriorating golf game, and we've all been there. <laughs> uh, but this patient, I guess, had uh, more of a, an excuse than most of us. And as we can see, this is a, a perfect example of uh, untreated tetralogy of Fallot. We can see all of the features here on this uh, cine imaging. And this technique has been around now for quite a while. Uh, we developed it originally at, at Northwestern, uh, but now it's pretty much used everywhere. <clears throat> and here's a, another example in somebody with bicuspid aortic stenosis with the same technique, uh, and we can see uh, the movement of, of the valve, the valve thickening, and also we can get this effect on the, uh, on the flow jet. Where are we? Probably best seen. Ah, anyway, you get the idea. Okay, well, we use uh, contrast agents in MRI quite a bit. And why would we want to do that? Well, the MRI signal can be greatly enhanced by the presence of paramagnetic chemicals. And these are analogous to the enhancement caused by uh, iodinated contrast agents on CT scanning. Uh, analogous in many ways, but there are also lots of differences. And for the past 30 years or so, which is as long as we've used uh, contrast in MRI, uh, the rare earth element gadolinium has formed the active element in virtually all MRI contrast agents, and that remains the case even to today. And what's the relevance of this, let's say, for the heart? Well, if we consider, you know, the one large uh, application of delayed enhancement imaging, uh, here's a sort of a cartoon summary uh, of the way that this uh, phenomenon um, 
presents itself. And the image on the left is normal or viable myocardium. The uh, image in the middle is as in an acute MI. Uh, and on the right, then, uh, a chronic MI or scar for whatever reason. Uh, and basically, <clears throat> the gadolinium agents that we use, uh, leaving aside the, you know, the chemistry uh, whereby they interact with the, uh, uh, the MRI measurement system, their distribution is really in the extracellular fluid space. So they map in steady state the extracellular fluid space. If we inject them as a bolus, just like with CT or uh, angiography, uh, we get an initial high concentration. But then once things settle down, uh, the agents leak into the uh, extracellular fluid space with the plasma and the interstitial fluid space. In normal myocardium, uh, the muscle is compact. Uh, so the, there isn't as much extracellular fluid uh, percentage volume fraction <clears throat> as, let's say, um, in scarred myocardium, where you get replacement of some of the myocytes by scar. Uh, therefore, <clears throat> the distribution volume for the gadolinium increases in almost everything where we get infiltration or scar or whatever. In acute infarction, the the cells become highly permeable as, as they become cytotoxic. And that, in turn, increases the, the distribution volume because the, the contrast just leaks in. So whatever the physics involved in sort of getting the images, uh, what we're looking at, or what the, the brightness reflects, is an increase in the local extracellular fluid volume. And that can be seen here, for example, <clears throat> in this image, bottom left. This is a uh, contrast enhanced delayed image showing, uh, this is from a cine image, uh, enhancement uh, of a good portion of the myocardium here in the uh, infralateral wall, <clears throat> and this is due to uh, transmural infarction. This is most commonly used, again, to look at uh, patients with ischemic heart disease, and here's a patient with a big uh, septal infarct and also an infarct in the uh, inferior and inferoseptal and infralateral wall. So numerically, that's where most of the action is. Um, but this can also, of course, be used in congenital heart disease, but it tends to be used less, less commonly. Um, perfusion imaging is something that's also done with MRI. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, here is a, uh, these are a bunch of images taken <clears throat> before we inject a bolus of contrast. These are short axis images through various uh, portions of the myocardium. And here we image fairly quickly the first pass of the agent as it comes through the, the right heart and then into the uh, left ventricle and then enhances the myocardium or doesn't, as the case may be. So here we can see fairly extensive subendocardial delayed uh, enhancement or delayed delivery of the contrast, suggesting uh, under, this is under stress with adenosine. Uh, that there's a, a steal. Then we let the patient rest and repeat this, and we see that these hypoperfused areas, in fact, have cleaned up, it's gone away. So this is a reversible perfusion defect. And for vascular imaging, <clears throat> why would we want to use contrast for vascular imaging with MRI? There are ways we can image blood vessels uh, without doing that. But with contrast, we can increase the speed and the simplicity. And again, we started to do this <clears throat> Oh, about 18 years ago. Uh, and these images are about that old, in fact. Um, uh, my experience, it takes 10 years <laughs> for things to catch on uh, in the community. Uh, but again, when we first did these, we, we could image patients with uh, Eisenmengers and so forth. Um, and this is now widely, widely used. Nowadays, Siemens calls this technique twist. Pierangelo has shown some examples. This is a patient with... Uh, uh, atrial switch for uh, DTGA. And again, we can see the appropriate filling of the pulmonary arteries and veins, uh, but filling of the, you know, the left atrium through the uh, systemic venous uh, baffle and the right atrium <clears throat> through the pulmonary venous baffle. Here again, we see the same thing, the anteriorly placed aorta and the <clears throat> pulmonary veins draining into the right atrium baffled here. 
We don't see the uh, systemic veins there because of a timing issue. And that's all very well. We've used these contrast enhanced techniques for years and years with uh, gadolinium, but there have been some issues. Uh, and you know, back in about 2006, uh, NSF, this is not the National Science Foundation, but nephrogenic systemic fibrosis uh, became recognized uh, as a problem in patients with severe renal failure uh, who are exposed to gadolinium. Uh, and in some instances, the, the rate of NSF was 3 to 5 percent, which was sort of unacceptable. Uh, we've taken precautions, and we tend to be very, very cautious about using gadolinium in patients with renal failure now. But uh, more recently, there have been observations of gadolinium deposition in the brain of patients who have normal renal function. And this has generated a whole new bit, bout of controversy. So we'll see where that goes. <clears throat> well, what about non-gadolinium MR contrast agents? Are there any such animals? Well, in fact, there is. And there's one we've been using for a couple of years <clears throat> with, with tremendous success. And it's called ferromoxetol. It's an iron-based contrast agent. It's a pure intravascular agent, so it stays in the blood. It's approved by the FDA for treating iron deficiency anemia in adults with chronic renal failure, uh, and it is not approved for MR imaging. So we use it off-label. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and we're careful. This is intravenous iron, so we're, we're careful to monitor for any adverse events. But touch wood, we have had absolutely no issues so far in about 320 patients. Uh, <clears throat> here we see dynamic first-pass imaging uh, of normal uh, thoracic and carotid arteries using basically 0.8 mLs of this agent, which is just 24 milligrams of iron. It's almost nothing. And here's a patient with a repaired coarctation. This patient also had a <clears throat> pacemaker and renal failure. And this agent enhances the entire blood pool. So as you can see on the left, you can see pre pretty much everything equally bright. Systemic veins, systemic arteries, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, portal vein, you name it. <clears throat> And again, uh, with software, we can sort of damp down some of the structures if we want to highlight others. So we, we basically have everything. And here you can see the residue of the uh, coarct. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this patient had a pacemaker. Uh, and Pierangelo mentioned the artifact we can see in patients with pacemakers on cine, and that's true. But with uh, ferromoxetol or ferrahim, we can make that go away. <clears throat> and here we can see the leads with almost no artifact and really beautiful definition uh, of the myocardium. Here's an 83-year-old patient who was claustrophobic, had an acute aortic syndrome. Uh, and we did this study in about 10 minutes with ferromoxetol. Uh, she also had renal failure, by the way. So here we can see there's actually intramural hemorrhage in the aortic arch, uh, as well as a huge complex aneurysm uh, of which we can see every nook and cranny. This would, in fact, be very difficult to image, even with modern CT, because I can guarantee you this would enhance very slowly. Then how do you time this? Difficult. Here's a patient, also claustrophobic, uh, with SVC obstruction and one or two collateral veins, which you can see here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> based on, the, uh, on this uh, Ferrahim venogram, she had successful intervention, the SVC. And again, this whole thing was done in about 10 minutes. Similarly, patients with renal impairment prior to TAVR, where you don't want to give uh, additional CT contrast, uh, they can do beautifully with ferromoxetol to define you know, uh, arterial access uh, and pretty much everything else. And just to finish up, <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, something that we, we developed here uh, at UCLA. <clears throat> using this, this agent, which is a, a four-dimensional technique uh, for imaging uh, the heart in, in children with congenital heart disease, which we call MUSIC. That's uh, multi-phase steady-state imaging uh, with contrast enhancement. And this is a 19-year-old <coughs> uh, with treated tetralogy of fellow. Again, it's gated, and we gate both to respiration and to, uh, uh, and to the cardiac signal. So basically, we can uh, we can see everything in three dimensions, but with a beating heart. And uh, this is done 
you know, under anesthesia in patients who are ventilated. That means we can do pretty much perfect correction for motion. And we'll notice, you know, the pulsatility uh, in the pulmonary arteries here, which is often a feature, as we know, of repaired uh, tetralogy of fellow. Here's uh, an eight-year-old, also post-tet repair. Notice how pulsatile the pulmonary arteries are here. And another very powerful feature we can add to this is the measurement of four-dimensional flow. Uh, Pierangelo mentioned uh, measuring flow uh, in two dimensions earlier on. With the same sort of approach, uh, we can do high-resolution music imaging, just like we've shown, and then lower resolution, but still very helpful flow imaging. So here we can see this free regurgitation across the pulmonary valve. And here's a, uh, a patient with an ASD. Again, these images in the, the left are uh, music with color rendering and without. Uh, this is just a, an arbitrary slice reconstructed from this. And here we have the 4D flow measurement, again reconstructed, showing the free flow across this ASD. And we measured a QPQS of 2.2 in this patient. And again, this is just during continuous ventilation with no breath holding. Uh, and this whole thing actually can be done quite quickly. Uh, here is, this is not an adult, uh, hopefully will be someday. <laughs> uh, this tiny little baby had uh, coarctation and a, and a hypoplastic arch. This again was done with a self-gated version of music. This developed by, again, Fei Han, who developed the original uh, music sequence. And again, we've got lots and lots of detail. Uh, and this has got 0.8 uh, millimeter isotropic resolution, which for MRI is actually pretty good. And to finish up, here's one last case, again in the neonate. <clears throat> uh, this child was thought to have a diaphragmatic hernia on echo, which turned out to be a sequestrated lung. Uh, and this is the uh, feeding artery here, which Dan Levy went and expertly embolized prior to surgery by Brian Reamson. Uh, here's the rest of what's going on in that same baby. Uh, far more going on than we have time to talk about uh, in this case but this, this child seems to have just about every congenital defect you could want to talk about. Uh, and this big thing here is the, uh, this is the, the vessel to the sequestrated lung segment. So in conclusion, uh, we're making continuous progress in cardiac MR for congenital heart disease. There's an increasing use of four-dimensional acquisition, an increasing use of four-dimensional flow imaging, and ongoing re research with the use of ferromoxtol. And I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues and collaborators, and thank you very much for your attention.